these data were acquired as an expanded data set. That is to say, rather than simply measuring seven spectra from the, the sample, what we've done is we've measured many spectra. So for each acquisition region, we've reduced the dwell time and acquired data into different VAMAS blocks. And the advantage of doing that is that you can retrospectively look at your data and examine what actually happened during the course of this experiment. In this example, a 2D detector has been used to split data spectra over thousands of VAMAS blocks. So this is an example here where it's just temporal. The data are split by time and if we look at the initial set of measurements and we sum these we get a spectral form for the serum 3D. If we then go to the end of the experiment and again sum a number of these measurements towards the end of the experiment using this select option then we end up with two different line shapes for this serum 3D that have apparently would have all been summed into this one form had we simply measured a single cerium 3D spectrum. Um, if we click these together into an, a new VAMAS file and you overlay them, you can, you can see that the total one is the one with the best signal to noise. And then we've got noisy data for the other two because we summed fewer VAMAS blocks. But if we use the least squares option, and decompose the total spectrum into these two initial and final spectra, you can see that the data is reproduced reasonably well. What we'd like to do is come up with a peak model to try and describe this total spectrum. And the initial spectrum and the final spectrum suggested that two shapes are sufficient to describe these data we can confirm this using principal component analysis. If you calculate the principal components from the Ethereum 3D, you can see that the first two have a spectral-like shape, while the third looks like noise. So this also gives us the opportunity to create spectra using PCA and reproducing using two abstract factors, so that we now have spectra with reasonable signal to noise that represent the initial spectrum and the final spectrum. And what we're doing now is trying to identify the amount of the initial spectrum that we have within the final spectrum. The, what we'd like to do is, is construct a line shape from that final spectrum that is characteristic of what needs to be added to the initial spectrum in order to reproduce the data set. So if we sc start scanning from the bottom of this list of different spectra, we will come up with a, a shape which hopefully has some kind of meaning in terms of chemistry. So we're looking for peak structures and offsets in binding energy. And once we've identified a shape, and in this case, we've gone with the initial shape and one that we've created by looking at these different spectra. We can then copy these two to the data file that contained the three that we were, had calculated by summing. And then we can reproduce these three spectra using the, the shapes that we've got here. And looking at the least squares solution, you find that you do get a good reproduction when we overlay these component peaks with the least squares solution. The next question is how can you use these least squares solutions and one of them is as a means of calculating a background that is a least squares solution background calculated from these component spectra. So in this case a U2 Tugar background with a, a given cross-section parameter yields a a plausible background for the, this 4 plus like peak structure. And having found this, we can create a peak model and we can do the same for the other component spectrum. And so we'll have a, a background plus a component model.
And then when we do the least squares calculation a, a further time, we can use the information from this peak model to create a peak model for each one of these summed spectra for the Cerium 3D. Since the Cerium 3D data envelope is quite involved, what we'll do is introduce a second region and use a null background type so that the background that was created by the first region is then replaced by the spectrum itself over the limits of that second region. And the idea is to isolate signal above background that is just associated with the Cerium 3D 5 halves peak. And then we can introduce peaks and fit these peaks to the 5 halves data without reference to the, the other data from the three halves and any satellite peaks that are here. So when we delete that null region, then we return to the, to the background over the entire region that was initially calculated. And having calculated peaks that are fitting the five halves peak, we can link using the lock option, which locks any components with the same component index. Uh, for the position, the forward half maximum, and the area. This means that we've we've got a an ensemble of peaks rather than an individual set of peaks. And when we have locked them and we copy and paste such an ensemble, we by selecting the controlling peak, we can move all four peaks that were originally pre prepared for the five halves doublet peak and position them and scale them for the three halves. So this is just a way of moving peaks around and trying to use information about part of a doublet to allow the, a peak model to progress. Now these are not intended to be chemically significant. This is more as a way of illustrating how a peak model could be created. And so we've just added a couple more peaks for these satellite peaks within the Cerium 4 plus state. And Ultimately, we end up with a peak model that have, has peaks and a background. And, and that's what we need to illustrate how this least squares solution can be used to construct a peak model. So we'll do the same for the second spectral component that we calculated. And the idea is to construct a background which is different from the first one. And again, this is by way of illustration. It's entirely feasible that the same background should be used in both of these spectral forms, but we'll just use a different cross-section field to illustrate that we get a different shape background from one component to the other. And again, we'll just add a set of peaks, and in this case, there are clearly five, at least five peaks here, so we'll, we'll put in five peaks just by way of illustrating how a set of component peaks can be constructed on these least squares basis spectra and then the least squares calculation transfers these basis component peaks onto the spectra that are targeted by the least squares calculation. So we'll just put a fifth peak in here and the peak that is added when you press the create button goes onto the spectrum where the residual for the display region is a maximum, hence zooming into that small peak, ensure that the, the small peak that was created actually went into the data where we, we would most expect it to go. So the next thing is we just need to make sure that the component index is the same for all of these peaks within the two models. And the reason that the component index is being set up, it's actually twofold. One is so that I can assign the names here using an equal operator. And so each component index that is the same as the index for the component for which I made the, the name change, when I press return with that equal in place, it will assign the same name to all of the components with the same component index. So I've done that for both of them. I've got Two, two spectral forms, two spectral basis functions, and if I enable the display based on component indices, I can then see clearly 
these different ensembles of peaks that are deriving from these different spectral components. And the idea now is to perform a least squares calculation using these two component spectral forms and the peak models are transferred from these basis spectra and displayed using a background that has been calculated from the basis spectra for each one of these three spectra that were summoned from the original data set. So once you've obtained a peak model and shapes such as these, these could be applied to the original data, even the, the data that had poor signal to noise.